Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Today is Friday, February 5th. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to the Friday series of DD up, DDA updates with Deputy Secretary Simons. Um, before we begin, I'd like to go over a few, few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are um, two handouts for the webinar. Um, there's one in the platform right now, and we will load the other one uh, shortly. They can also be emailed upon request. We are recording the webinar today, and we'll post um, that on the DDA website. Questions can be typed in the question or chat box in the webinar panel, and we will get towards get those answered towards the end of the presentation today. So now I'd like to introduce Deputy Secretary Simons. Good afternoon. Good afternoon and thank everybody for being on this uh, webinar again. Um, and I wanna thank everybody um, from the bottom of my heart. I mean, you've been so, so great with us. You've been with us since last March. Um, you've been giving us uh, a lot of support, uh, some helpful uh, recommendations about what we need to uh, address that would be helpful to you. Today, we have an opportunity, obviously, to do our COVID-19 updates, as well as having uh, Kenny Fetter, who has been with us multiple times and has given us wonderful information uh, about uh, COVID and uh, best practices, et cetera, and his uh, uh, experience with the Center for Disease Control and, and assigned to the uh, Maryland Department of Health. And also we have Jesse Messenberg today from Hopkins uh, School of Medicine uh, from the, the Division of Infection Disease. Uh, and she's also working with the Baltimore City Health Department. And then we'll be able to uh, take some questions. Next slide, please. And so, um, you know, again, I, I, my sincere appreciation to everybody who's been with us on these webinars and your feedback and recommendations. Um, you know, we've got a lot of different uh, areas that we provide supports to. We've got people who are in residential services, day services. We've got staff, families. We have micro boards. We have people who are self-directing. And we need to make sure that we are uh, addressing all of uh, the needs of all of the folks, depending upon your uh, specific situation. And I can't emphasize enough to please continue to practice a social distancing, washing your hands, uh, and uh, being able to uh, uh, stay out of large gatherings for you and your staff so that everybody uh, remains uh, safe. Next slide, please. So we know that the governor did a press conference uh, and basically said that uh, today that uh, the state will be opening a series of max, mass vaccination sites uh, to serve people who are eligible within our um, uh, numbers where 1A, 1B, and, and 1C. Uh, and those sites are, are going to be opened, obviously, in at the Baltimore Convention Center and Six Flags uh, America in Prince George's County. And those announcements were made already. And then also that beginning on February 11th, the C CBS pharmacies will begin providing uh, vac vaccines at uh, 18 locations. And you can see the locations up there between Baltimore and Bowie all the way through to uh, Rockville. And so they're up there. Um, again, you know, I don't have to repeat this. You've got it. You'll have access to these slides. It'll be on the web, as uh, Donna said, and uh, they should be in a handout. And so appointments uh, will become uh, available for booking uh, as soon as uh, next Tuesday, uh, February 9th. Next slide. And so um, Six Flags uh, basically opened this morning uh, with a, uh, a soft launch, as they call it. Uh, I believe the governor was there. And this uh, is a partnership between uh, the Maryland Department of Health, the National Guard, Kaiser Paramenti, and uh, obviously Prince George's County Executive was there with the governor this morning. Um, and in coordination with all of these uh, 
Prince George's uh, County officials, uh, we've done outreach from the department uh, to start taking a look at pre-registration for individuals so that uh, the appointments can start and they can uh, register to uh, receive their uh, vaccines. The National Guard from uh, our state is also has uh, vaccination uh, teams that will provide uh, support for the site. And that uh, when we said that the Kaiser Paramenti uh, will, they will be there, they will be, be providing pharmacy services and uh, post-vaccination uh, observations. I mean, many of us have seen on um, the reports that uh, once people get the shots, that the people who are concerned is there an adverse reaction or not. So they usually have people stay about 30 minutes to make sure that everybody's uh, okay. Um, from what I understand, there's been, uh, uh, that's been a successful uh, part of the program. And so again, uh, vaccinations at these areas are by appointment only. And uh, when you receive, uh, you, you'll get an appointment for your second dose will be scheduled simultaneously. So you'll get first and second dose. And, and recognize that, you know, this is uh, coming from the federal government so that there's no fees and, you know, there's no insurance uh, information to be collected, uh, et cetera. So people should be very uh, relaxed uh, as much as they can be. I know some people have, uh, don't like needles, but uh, for the greater good, we need to get this done and get everybody uh, vaccinated. Next slide. All right, so the convention center uh, is going to open up, and um, basically the convention center has been the field hospital, as many of you know, um, and it's in a partnership with the University of Maryland uh, Medical System and Johns Hopkins Medicine. And obviously people can go on and register, and here's the link to register that's uh, in the second uh, bullet. <clears throat> or first bullet, second paragraph, and due to the high volume of requests, uh, you know, there might be some wait times, et cetera. We know that uh, we have not been getting, um, um, uh, there has not been a lot of, of uh, vaccinations shipped to the states, and there's been a lot of requests to uh, increase that production, and hopefully we see that uh, from the federal government soon. And uh, basically, you can see that at the convention center, it's basically going to run from 9 to 4.30, uh, Monday through Friday. Next slide, please. So the state did open up a, a statewide call center to its toll-free uh, to assist eligible folks uh, with making their appointments uh, for the uh, state-run mass vaccination sites, as we said. Um, at uh, uh, Six Flags, as well as the convention, uh, the Baltimore Convention Center. And then additionally, you can see that there is the projection by mid-February that uh, m and Bank Stadium uh, will open and that there will be further information uh, disseminated about where in western, southern, and east on the east shore uh, there will be other uh, opportunities for people that the state will open. Next slide, please. So uh, in accordance with the federal guidelines, Maryland is currently in phase 1C. The governor uh, announced that uh, at one of, our last, um, one of his last press conferences. And obviously the vaccine distribution includes people who are 65 and over, as well as special needs group homes. So that's our people in residential services and developmentally disabled population. That's all of us within uh, our uh, DD administration, as well as uh, people who probably have uh, a diagnosis of uh, uh, developmental disabilities who uh, may or may not receive any funding from DDA, but uh, sometimes we're not sure who that is uh, because they have not presented uh, to us through the regional offices. And then uh, obviously all Marylanders uh, of any age in assisted living, independent living, uh, behavioral health, et cetera, uh, are part of, of this whole thing and part of the federal long-term care pharmacy uh, partnership program. So again, we've got 
one uh, A, and then when we started, you can see with the arrow on the 18th, one B, and then uh, January 25th, one uh, C. Next slide, please. So uh, obviously, uh, we just want to go back in case people did not have an opportunity uh, to view the governor's uh, press conferences when he talked about the executive order that's starting on February 1, a few days ago, that uh, restaurants and bars are no longer uh, required to close at 10 p.m. and that uh, there was an amended directive on various healthcare matters such as uh, extending uh, testing for travelers um, to the 28th of the month and uh, patient transfer rules until uh, the end of March. Next slide, please. So I want to give you an update on where we are with uh, numbers as we've been doing uh, on our webinars. And, uh, you know, we'll start with uh, people who are in our uh, support. So the central region has uh, 780 confirmed positives, um, 1,149 negative, And we have had uh, 48 people who have uh, passed away. In the east region, 130. Uh, positive, uh, 357 negative, and five uh, individuals who have passed away. Um, in the South region, 514 positive, uh, 180 negative, and uh, 25 people who have passed away. And in uh, the West region, 337 are confirmed positives. Um, 382 negative and 14 people who have passed away. Um, we, uh, when it comes to uh, our staff, um, we in the South region have had 368 uh, positives and five deaths. Uh, we've had 191 uh, positives in the West region and two deaths. Uh, in the East region, 195 positive and two deaths and in uh, the central region, 605 uh, positives, and uh, we have had uh, two deaths. Next slide, please. So this information uh, is a pie chart on the left that shows the total number of people that we provide supports to uh, in DDA, which about 9% uh, have tested uh, positive for COVID since uh, uh, since March of 2020. So, Bernie, something happened with this last show. I don't see the data. Uh, Donna, do you uh, do you have the right uh, presentation? We are on slide 11. I'll try to pull it up. Okay, please do. Uh, hold on, Bernie, for a second until she pulls that up. Okay, pulling up slide 11. That's great, thank you. So so we've done this uh, in the past. This is just a basic update of where we are as, as uh, we move uh, forward. Um, and so obviously we've got 17,764 uh, people and we've got 9% of our population now uh, that have tested uh, positive since uh, March of uh, last year. And then you'll see that the chart on the right shows uh, from January 7th um, where we are with an increase of the number of participants. Um, and then you can see the breakdown uh, where we are by region with 61, 25, 27, and 39 uh, of the people who have uh, tested uh, positive. So, you know, we are still seeing uh, an increase uh, you know, I, I hope at some point we won't see that increase. We get people vaccinated and people keep their social distancing and washing their hands, et cetera. And it, uh, we get uh, this COVID-19 behind us. Next slide. 
So this is uh, the chart on the left uh, since January 7th to the um, yesterday, the 4th of, of February. Uh, we've had uh, an additional uh, 13 uh, people uh, pass away uh, from COVID. And then you see the pie chart on the right uh, shows the 92 uh, that have uh, passed away, which represents a 5% of the people who have tested positive. Um, I just want to give my condolences to um, families, direct support professionals, providers, um, the case management, the CCSs, who have worked with all of these people who have passed away, who are in our supports, as well as uh, direct support professionals and other staff that uh, we've lost during this pandemic. Next slide, please. This basically shows, and we started this uh, a couple of uh, webinars back about people who are self-directing, and you can see uh, that we've had uh, a slight increase uh, up to 30 people who have tested positive, and we've had a zero people of the over 1,200 people that are in uh, self-direction. So I think that uh, you know people in self-direction have done a good job, as well as everybody else. I mean, our numbers could be very high, but they're not, they're low. People have been very conscientious, and I just want to thank everybody for the hard work uh, that they've been doing. You know, next, this upcoming month in March, it'll be a year um, since, uh, you know, the pandemic started and the governor uh, declared a, an emergency in the state. So um, it's been, I think, going on a, a lot longer than I expected or probably anybody else expected. but. Uh, again, I think everybody's done an outstanding job, and I, from from uh, the bottom of my heart, I got to thank everybody for all the hard work you're doing and how conscientious everybody's doing, and and just trying to maintain safety and and being successful. So I'm going to ask Dr. Fetter, uh, who's on with us, as I mentioned earlier, um, he has been on previous uh, webinars with us and been uh, very very informative. So. Uh, we're actually fortunate uh, to have him uh, join us to get today for this we webinar. So, Dr. Fetter. Uh, thank you, uh, Director Simons, and thank you, everybody, for having me once again. Um, uh, I, I want to start uh, just by echoing uh, what Director Simon said in, in expressing um, my sadness and condolences at, at everything that's happened since the last time we spoke. You know, I know that this has been an incredibly difficult few months uh, for all of you who are serving people with disabilities in the state of Maryland because of the level of spread that has occurred and because of the number of deaths that have occurred. And I'm so, so sorry to everyone, to the, to the residents, the staff, to the families for your losses. Um, you know, I see every day the Herculean efforts that providers are making to keep your residents and staff safe. And this is a brutal and dangerous virus. And what's happening is not happening because of the things you're doing. It's the opposite. Everything you're doing is making things better than they would be, is making people safer. So I wanna thank you for that. And you know, with vaccination and continuing to push the other measures, we are going to move out of this pandemic. I, I don't know when and I, I don't, uh, you know, there are continue to be challenges. We have to remain vigilant, but, um, you know, the things you are doing are making a difference. And as we move into vaccination, they're gonna to continue to make a difference. So thank you. Um, I apologize. Um, unlike some other days, I don't have slides today, uh, but I wanted to come on because there's a few things I wanted to address. So recognizing that it's much harder to remember this information without slides, please know that uh, as always, if you follow up, with questions. I won't be able to take them on the webinar because I do want to preserve time for Dr. Messenberg, but I will answer the questions and respond to DDA who can get back to you. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a few different things today because they're important emerging topics sort of in COVID and then what we're doing here at the state just to address some things that we might be able to do to help you. Um, and, uh, you know, let me let us know if you have any follow up questions. So the final caveat, um, one thing I'm not going to talk about is registering or scheduling people for vaccination or the timeline for vaccination. Uh, 
And that's because I, I don't know. And I can't answer your questions about that. Um, if you have questions and they come to me, that's fine. I will forward them along to my colleagues who work in vaccination. I'm sorry I can't talk about that today on today's webinar, but I just want to be upfront about that. You know, I can answer questions about the science of vaccines, but I cannot talk about scheduling or logistics of vaccination because I won't know the answers to the questions. So, okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is an issue that's come up for a lot of group home programs, which is the following. You have a staff person who works in your program, maybe works in another program too, and they test positive for COVID-19. And maybe they test positive on a Thursday, but they're not scheduled to work until the next week, until Tuesday or something like that. And so they wait until next Tuesday and they call you and they say, I'm not coming into work because I have COVID-19. And at that point, it's been four or five days that you've had an outbreak in your group home and you didn't know. Or another thing that happens is maybe you have a provider who uh, tests positive for COVID-19 working at one group home program. So that group home program excludes them from work because they know about it, but the other group home doesn't know about it. And so they continue to work there. So for the most part, this doesn't happen, but every once in a while it does. And when these sorts of things do happen, they lead to a delay in our response to COVID-19, right? Because as soon as you know that staff person's positive, you want to institute testing, you want to review your infection control protocols, make sure that they're as strong as they can possibly be. And we have seen some large outbreaks linked to when this happens. Staff people who've worked in multiple homes while infected or other things like that. So this is incredibly frustrating because every single positive COVID-19 test result is reported to the state of Maryland. So in principle, we know your staff are positive. We just don't know that they work for you until they've chosen to voluntarily disclose it to you. And so if we knew they were your staff, we could let you know possibly faster than they let you know themselves. So that you could make sure that person is appropriately excluded from work and is abiding by the isolation order they're supposed to be abiding. So what I wanted to let you know about is a pilot program that we have set up to try to start doing this. So we have started this with two group home providers, one from the central region and one from the southern region. And what those providers have done is that they have provided us with a roster of all of their staff, both those who work with group homes and then those who work with clients who do not work with live in group homes, but who live in their own homes. So all client facing staff. And what we've done is we've taken their rosters and we've set up a program to check each day to see if anyone on that roster was reported as positive for COVID-19 to the state of Maryland. And if they are, we notify the county health department to get in touch with the program. The idea being that maybe we can catch some of these cases that aren't necessarily disclosing their test results to you in a timely manner a little bit faster um, and let you know to make sure that they're excluded from work. So thus far, we're doing this with two providers and covering about 700 staff people, um, and it's going relatively smoothly. Now, I wanna question that this system isn't foolproof, it's not perfect, it's a pilot. So there will be people who test positive who we don't necessarily catch because of silly things like spelling errors and how their name was written on their lab slip when it was submitted for testing or something like that. Um, but we have caught a few providers who in the past um, tested positive for COVID-19, but for one reason or another, their program wasn't aware of it. So if you are interested in participating, you know, if you're saying to yourself, you know, I have staff, you know, who, you know, I have some concern that maybe my staff are not always going to report their COVID-19 test results immediately in a timely manner. And there's basically three reasons they could do that. One, they don't know they have to or they're choosing not to. Uh, second of all, they're just not doing it until they don't have to come into work. So, you know, they call in sick, but they don't tell you until they call in sick. Or three, if they're in the hospital, they may not be able to report. Um, you know, any of those things, what you can do is reach out to your regional director and we will follow up with more information. And we will obtain work with you to obtain a roster of all the staff who work in your program. And we will watch to see if any of them test positive. And if they do, we will get in touch with the local health department to contact you and let you know that your staff person has tested positive and you should open an outbreak investigation. And a lot of times you'll already know because that staff person will have voluntarily disclosed 
which is a good thing. And we still want that to be the primary mechanism by which we identify cases in, you know, uh, staff serving people with disabilities. But this is a second tool that we're trying to set up to try to help you more so that you don't have staff who are working while positive. So if this is something you are interested in participating in uh, or trying out, or even if you're not sure you want to participate in this, um, you know, reach out to your regional director. Uh, and just to address, you know, one concern that I know a lot of people have up front. So remember, as the health department, all positive COVID-19 test results are already reported to us anyway. And we can use that information to, when it is necessary to do so, to prevent the spread of infection for an urgent public health need. And so if you, it is permitted for you to participate in this program. I guess what I'll say is, you know, it is permitted for you to provide us information about your staff so we can watch to see if your staff has positive for COVID-19 and help keep them and you safer in a more time. So that's all I'll say about that. Um, and if you have questions or you think you might be interested in participating, please reach out to your regional director and they can get in touch, put us in touch and we can work on setting that up because it is working okay for the programs where we've started this so far. Although thankfully for the last couple of weeks, we have not identified any positives since we first started. Okay, so the second thing that I want to talk about is a topic that some of you may have seen in the news. Um, and so I just want to raise this issue just so you are aware we're thinking about it and try to sort of get to some key facts about it and also dispel um, some myths that may be out there. Um, and, and the topic is uh, what are called genetic variants or mutants of the virus causes that causes COVID-19. So you may have seen stories in the media about new strains of COVID-19 or about mutant versions of COVID-19 or about genetic changes to COVID-19 or about how the virus is becoming more infectious or more dangerous in some way. And all of these refer to the same thing. And so what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about what is that thing um, and uh, sort of what does it mean for our public health? So what has happened is the following. Following. So COVID-19 is caused by a virus and viruses, all viruses that are out there and particularly respiratory viruses mutate. What that means is that inside that virus is, um, is something called RNA, which is sort of like your DNA. It's sort of like the code that programs the virus and makes the virus what it is. You know, it's the instructions for how the virus works, okay? And over time, as viruses move from people to people, each time they move and they multiply and they make more viruses and those viruses jump to a new person, their RNA changes just a little bit and they become just a little bit different. No better, no worse on average. Doesn't mean that much. It's just a normal part of being viruses. Sometimes, by chance, uh, sort of maybe sometimes pushed on by things that are happening in the world or in the environment, uh, these mutations, these random changes in the virus's genetic code and their RNA will cause the virus to change in some meaningful way, that it affects the way that it affects humans. So with the virus that causes COVID-19, we now think this has happened at least three times, that there are, there are some new types or new strains of the virus that causes COVID-19, okay? And these new strains pose some new challenges. They represent a significant problem that makes it somewhat harder for us to get the pandemic under control. So, you know, so I'm going to talk about each of these three strains in detail, but um, I'm going to also uh, send after the webinar to the leadership a link to CDC's website that talks about each of these three strains in more detail. But the first one is called B.1.1.7. Okay, that's B.1.1.7. And in the media, you may have heard this one referred to as the UK variant, okay? And that's because it was originally identified as spreading in the UK, uh, but it's not only in the UK. It's spread to lots of parts of the world now, including Maryland. 
Um, and the problem with B.1.1.7 is that basically it's basically the same as the coronavirus that we're all unfortunately all too familiar with, but it's a little bit more contagious. It's a little bit more contagious, which means the following. We have all these measures that we use to prevent the spread of COVID-19, like wearing masks and social distancing, and those measures are effective. But when we don't follow those measures, sometimes if you're exposed to COVID-19, you'll get infected, and sometimes you won't, just by luck. The problem with B.1.1.7 is you're less likely to get lucky. So when we let our guard down, it's more likely to result in infection because this particular type of the virus is a little bit more infectious. And so what that means is, is that without strong control measures and adhering to the control measures that we have, we could see the virus start spreading even more rapidly than it already is because of this B.1.1.7 variant that's shown up in the UK. Okay, so that's B.1.1.7. The other two that I'm going to talk about are B.1.351. That's one of them. And then the second one is called P.1. And these respectively come from South Africa and Brazil. That's where they were originally identified, but they also have spread to other parts of the, of the world. And so there's no reason to think, you know, that just because they originally came from South Africa or Brazil, that doesn't mean, you know, anything particularly unusual happened there or that, you know, those variants only exist there. They've now spread to other parts of the world, including in the case of B.1.351 to Maryland. Now, the problem with these variants is that there's some concern that they may be a little bit harder for the immune system to fight in people who have already either had COVID-19 or who have already been vaccinated against COVID-19. We don't know for sure, but there is some concern that for these two new types of the virus, the B.1.351 and the P1, and B.1.351 is here uh, in Maryland, um, the vaccines we are using could be somewhat less effective. So that's obviously concerning because vaccines are an important tool for controlling the spread of COVID-19. So what I want to emphasize here today is that, you know, the most important takeaway is the following. First, these variants are out there and they make our jobs more challenging. Second, you know, the Department of Health is aware of this problem and we are trying to scale up our efforts to identify these variants and then prioritize our efforts to get them under control. But third and most importantly, what these variants do is they make the control strategies that you are already using. That means wearing a respirator during your work and wearing a mask whenever you're in a public place, practicing physical distancing by avoiding crowds and closed spaces and staying six feet apart from other people whenever possible, washing your hands thoroughly, and as soon as we become eligible, getting COVID-19 vaccination and trying to enroll people for vaccination as fast as possible, they become even more important because all of these tools remain fully or mostly effective at preventing the spread of these new variants. And in particular, I wanna emphasize this about the vaccines. You may see in the media that the vaccines don't work as well against some of these new variants. That's true or it may be true, but they still work extremely well. They're still excellent vaccines to the best of our knowledge. And in particular, what they still seem to do very well is prevent hospitalization and death. So in other words, people who are vaccinated, even if they're exposed to one of these new strains and they catch COVID-19, we expect it will be much more mild and they're much less likely to die. And so vaccines can save hundreds and thousands of lives. And these new strains make vaccination and getting everybody in for vaccination as fast as possible. And, you know, talking to people about vaccination and the safety importance of vaccination, even more important, not less important. So that's what I want to say about the new strains. And I wanted you to be aware that they're out there. The final thing I want you to be aware of is that, you know, these strains are not always easy to identify, but it is possible that, you know, we will identify that, 
a group home where a GDA provider has been exposed to one of these new strains. And if that happens, you know, the protocols are that you're familiar with are should be basically the same, but you can expect that the local health department will get in touch with you and that they may sort of have more extensive follow-up. They may ask for additional testing or they may ask for additional protective measures for staff. Um, and since these are new, you know, I can't tell you exactly what that will look like, but if that happens, the local health department will get in touch with you. They will work with you in the event of the exposure to try to help you, you know, control the situation. And I expect it won't be that different from what you're already familiar with. I just want you to be aware that these strains are out there. And so, you know, this could be something that a local health department contacts you. Okay. The final thing I just want to touch on, and it's somewhat related to these new strains, is masks and respirators. So some of you may have seen stories in the media uh, about masks and about how now is a better time than ever to sort of improve the quality and the number of our masks. So, you know, people talking about double masking, I've received a number of questions about double masking. I've also received a number of questions about respirators, you know, about the KN95 respirators you're receiving. Are they safe? Can we use them? Are we permitted to use them? without a respiratory protection program. Okay, so I wanna sort of touch a little bit on, on all of these new issues related to masks. The first and most important is, is that, you know, any mask is better than no mask. Um, and masks remain one of the most important tools for, we have for preventing the spread of the virus. And that's true with the new variants and without the new variants. The second thing is about um, the guidance about, uh, you know, double masking that some people have talked about. So essentially wearing one mask over top of a second mask or wearing a cloth mask over top of a surgical mask. So if you want to do that in your personal life or your staff want to do that in their personal life, no harm done. When working in group homes, we ask that staff use disposable products like um, you know, K N95 or KN95 respirators or surgical masks, okay? and not use cloth masks. Uh, the reason being that cloth masks are not made for the most part to sort of any minimal quality standard. So we don't know which is better and which is worse. Okay, and so when providers, and also because, um, you know, there's concern about using cloth masks over and over and over again, when working in a healthcare setting, which is different than just going about the world, that they could become contaminated with other organisms that could cause problems. So. We really want staff who are working in group homes to be using surgical masks at minimum or respirators, okay? Now, that doesn't mean that if you want your staff to, to double up, you know, you can't do that. You can do that. That's absolutely okay. There's no recommendation to do it, but there's also no recommendation to do it against it. If you're going to do that, you know, wear a respirator, wear a surgical mask over the respirator, or wear two surgical masks. Don't put a cloth mask over the surgical mask, please, because we don't want, you know, non-disposable cloth products used in healthcare settings as masks, if at all possible. And finally, I just want to say those respirators that DDA is providing, KN95 respirators, or if you're using KN95 respirators, you are permitted to use them. You're absolutely permitted to use them, and they might provide additional protection relative to the surgical mask, so you're absolutely permitted to use them. I know some people have asked questions about respiratory protection programs. So a respiratory protection program is required if you require your staff to use a respirator. You know, DDA staff are not required to use a respirator. They're required to use a surgical mask or a respirator. So basically you're just using the respirator in place of a surgical mask. That's fine. If you're doing that, you can use those respirators. So, you know, in summary, you know, Everybody should keep wearing masks. Masks are more important than ever. Um, it's totally okay for that mask to be one of those N95 or KN95 respirators that you've been provided by DDA. If folks are thinking about double masking because you've seen it in the media and it provides a sense of safety, that's totally fine. It can't hurt, but we ask that you please not use cloth masks in healthcare settings. Try to use disposable masks appropriately. Okay, I will stop there and I will hand things over uh, to. Uh, 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 Dr. Messenberg, um, and thank you so much for joining as well. If you have questions, please uh, send them to the webinar organizers, and I will respond in the next couple of days. Thank you for your time, and as always, I'm grateful to be here.
Hi, everybody. This is Nick. Before I introduce uh, uh, Jesse Messenberg, I just want to say thanks to Dr. Fetter for all of his wealth of information and that he has taking hopefully such a liking to our group and uh, we look forward to the next time he comes back on. Um, I did want to introduce uh, Jesse Messenberg, who I met a few weeks ago last month um, in the region's ongoing efforts to collaborate with our local public health entities regarding the COVID vaccine. Um, and Jesse and I, I think, have developed a pretty good uh, collaborative working relationship with each other. Um, and I really appreciated her commitment to public health, people with disabilities, and equity as it relates to vaccine distribution. Um, and so today, Jesse, we invited Jesse to come on from Baltimore City Health Department to talk a little bit about what Baltimore City is doing um, specifically in regards to vaccine distribution, as I know that we have talked about that this really is a local public health approach in collaboration with the state and federal government. So without further ado, Jesse, the floor is yours. Thanks, everyone. Um, and thank you, Nick. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here today. Um, does do, do you guys have my slides available? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. Um, perfect. Okay. Um, again, thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. My name is Jesse Messenberg. I'm a nurse practitioner with the Baltimore City Health Department and Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. I'm part of the COVID vaccination team for the city of Baltimore, and I'm here today to share some updates. Um, do you want to go to the next slide? Yep. And then the next one. Perfect. I want to start off by making it clear that Baltimore City Health Department is committed to creating a COVID vaccine strategy that is anti-racist and focused on building trust. I think, yep, there we go. Um, many Baltimore residents and their families have experienced racism in the healthcare system and may be skeptical about the vaccine. Through our strategy, um, Baltimore City Health Department and the city want to build trust, knowing that this will take time and concerted effort beyond this pandemic. We want everyone in the city to have accurate information about the vaccine so that they can make an informed decision uh, with the people they trust. Next slide. Here's just a little agenda of things I wanted to talk about today. Um, I'm gonna, again, go over um, some vaccine information, probably um, much that you already know. Um, gonna talk about the BCHD, the Baltimore City Health Department's uh, plan, vaccine strategy in special populations. I wanted to discuss our ambassador program and um, open for questions if we have time. Next slide. So infection with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 can cause a range of illnesses from mild symptoms to severe illness and even death. About 30% of persons infected with SARS-CoV-2 do not have any symptoms. No one can predict how severe anybody's symptoms um, will be, but certain factors may increase your risk. Some people are more likely than others to become severely ill when infected. This includes older adults, or people with certain medical conditions, including Down syndrome, diabetes, obesity, cancer, and heart disease. Next slide. There are actions everyone can take um, and should take to help prevent COVID-19. This includes wearing a mask that covers your nose and mouth, avoiding close contact with others as much as possible, avoiding touching your face with unwashed hands, cleaning uh, frequently touched surfaces um, frequently, um, washing your hands with soap and water or using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer if soap and water isn't available. These are all tools in our toolbox. And the more tools we use to prevent the spread of the virus, uh, the safer we'll all be. Next slide. COVID-19 vaccination is a safer way to build protection. 
Getting the virus that causes COVID-19 may offer some natural protection known as immunity, but experts don't know how long this protection lasts and the risk of severe illness and death from COVID-19 far outweighs the benefits of immunity from getting sick with COVID-19. The vaccine helps protect you and others around you. Next slide. It's easy to be confused by all the information that is circulating, some which is conflicting. Um, so I wanted to go over a couple key facts about the vaccine. The vaccine will not give you COVID-19. None of the vaccines that are currently authorized or in development in the United States have live or dead virus in them. So it is impossible for any of the vaccines to give you COVID-19. People who have gotten sick with COVID-19 still benefit from getting vaccinated because experts do not know how long someone is protected from getting sick again after recovering from COVID-19. Evidence um, that we have so far suggests that immunity after getting sick with COVID-19 may not last very long. Getting vaccinated protects you from getting sick with COVID-19. The vaccine works by teaching your immune system how to recognize and fight the virus that causes COVID-19. And this protects you from getting sick. And last, the COVID-19 vaccine, um, the cur currently there are two vaccines authorized for use. They're both mRNA vaccines, and they do not change or interact with your DNA in any way. The vaccines work by teaching our cells how to make a protein that triggers immunity. Um, the vaccine itself never enters our DNA. Next slide. I wanna emphasize that COVID-19 vaccines are being held to the same safety standards as other routine vaccines. Scientists have been working with mRNA vaccines for more than a decade, and were able to quickly apply them to the COVID-19 virus. Enormous amounts of funding um, from the federal government allowed scientists to work faster without skipping any steps. In fact, the COVID-19 vaccine probably has more data to support its approval than any other vaccine in history. Because the disease was spreading so fast, they were able to show the vaccine worked much sooner than they would have for other vaccines. And after any vaccine is authorized and in use, both the FDA and the CDC continue to monitor the safety of the vaccine. Next slide. There's currently two vaccines authorized for um, use, the Moderna vaccine and the Pfizer vaccine. They're pretty similar. Um, they're both mRNA vaccines. They're both um, between 94 and 95% effective, which is huge. Um, they're both two doses. And um, the Moderna is approved for age 18 and older, while the Pfizer is approved for age 16 and older. This is because kids weren't in um, Younger kids weren't in the original studies, but ongoing studies are happening now. So hopefully the age range will be expanded with time. Um, and they've both been sh shown to reduce the risk of severe disease of COVID-19. Next slide. The vaccine teaches our immune system how to recognize and fight the virus that causes COVID-19. Sometimes this process does cause symptoms, such as mild headache, low-grade fever, or body aches. Common side effects are mild to moderate, meaning at most you might want to stay home from work for the day, but it's not severe. Um, side effects go away with Tylenol or ibuprofen and usually last under 24 hours. These symptoms are normal and a sign that the body is building protection against the virus that causes COVID-19. Next slide. The COVID-19 vaccine protects you, your family, your friends, and your community. I encourage you guys to choose to get vaccinated. Share your experience with coworkers, friends, and family. You have a role in ending the COVID-19 pandemic, and sharing your experience may influence those that care about you. Next slide. Okay, so let's look at Maryland's um, COVID distribution plan. And um, Baltimore City is 
um, all of the all of the cities and counties in Maryland are basing their vaccine distribution plan on, on Maryland's policies. So um, we're currently in phase 1C. Uh, the list who's included in each phase changes very frequently, sometimes on the daily. So I encourage um, everyone to check the Maryland Department of Health website for the most up-to-date information on who's included in which phase. Um, that website is coronavirus.maryland.gov. Um, but as of today, I ch just checked this morning to get the most up-to-date. And as of today, um, 1C includes individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It also includes assisted living, independent supported living, group homes, and other congregate living settings. This includes the residents, the staff, and the volunteers of all of these um, uh, residential facilities. It includes people experiencing homelessness, people in shelters and transitional housing. 1C includes uh, healthcare workers and other frontline staff, and it also includes people over 65. So these, th these are Maryland, the state of Maryland's um, phases. And we're not there yet, and I don't know when we will be, but um, phase two includes people with certain high-risk medical conditions. So phase two does include um, high-risk medical conditions like diabetes, obesity, cancer, high blood pressure, heart disease, Down syndrome, among others. And again, this also changes daily, so do check the Maryland Department of Health website. Um, what phase we're in and who's included is up to Maryland Department of Health or Governor Hogan. And I um, made sure to double check today, but currently there's no prioritization of caregivers of people with disabilities under the Maryland Department of Health plan. So uh, next slide. At this time, the federal government is giving the state of Maryland approximately 10,000 doses a day for over 1.5 million people who are eligible. Um, I know that I have the Alabama public health picture there, but it was I couldn't find a better one to sort of describe where we're at. Um, and we're kind of in the middle you know, we're beyond just healthcare workers and long-term care staff, but the limited supply um, has been um, a, the biggest issue here in, in distribution. Um, so the state of Maryland then distributes the vaccine to each city and county. And how much vaccine the state distributes to each city or county is remains unclear. Baltimore City is not, um, never 100% you know, we, we request um, our number of vaccines, but the number that the state of Maryland gives us um, is up to MDH. And currently, Baltimore City has a very limited supply, um, so much so that all the appointments at Baltimore City's mass vaccination site is booked up. So regardless of what phase we're in, um, the amount of vaccine that Baltimore City receives from the state determines how many people we can vaccinate. Once supply is available, individuals will be able to sign up for appointments at their local health department or um, Maryland Department of Health website. Ultimately, our aim is that all individuals and groups have equal opportunity to receive the vaccine. Next slide. Let's um, dig in a little deeper into Baltimore City's plan. Um, so fair and equitable distribution of the vaccine is fundamental to Baltimore City's plan. Baltimore City Health Department is prioritizing populations at higher risk for COVID-19 and complications from the illness. We have formed a number of specialty population groups and have assigned a team of experts and individuals with lived experience to each group to develop a strategy and distribution plan that works well for each specialty population. There's active coordination between the DDA um, the Maryland Department of Health and the federal government to make sure that people can get vaccinated as soon as possible. Next slide. Because supply is so limited right now, um, as we get supply, we're currently using the following criteria to prioritize vaccination of specialty populations 
that fall into phase 1C. This criteria aims to reduce outbreaks and uh, the risk of severe complications from illness. Um, as you can see, history, like congregate living settings, um, the size of the facility um, and history of COVID outbreak are major prioritizations, um, along with vulnerable um, or underlying conditions, um, staff crossover, which was mentioned earlier, um, and availability of um, clinical partners to help with vaccine administration. This will make more sense on the next slide. Let's go to that one. Next slide. Hello. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, oops. One, one before that. That might have been my bad. Perfect. It seems like. Is there a slide that? It, um, what's the one after this one? You have this specialty population, and then after that, that's it. Okay. I'm looking for the slide that says um, specialty population strategy. Um, that is slide 30. I'm sorry? Slide 30, where you have the mass vaccine. We have about five more minutes, so do you, um, do you want to just go ahead and go through it, and we'll, we'll share what we miss with the group? Yep. Oh, there it is. Great. So Baltimore City is developing a vaccine plan strategy for specialty populations um, that utilize three different ways to get vaccinated. One is through mass vaccination sites. So this works best for people who are able to go to one of the state or city's mass vaccination sites. We recognize that this won't work for many people. Um, next is reallocation of doses. This is reallocation of doses to facilities and organizations that have medical staff on site. So in this plan, BCHC, the Baltimore City Health Department, will provide the vaccine and then clinical staff at the organization or facility will vaccinate their own clients, residents, and staff. And last are our mobile vaccine teams. And um, we also recognize that this may be um, really where m most people get vaccinated. Um, and this is a situation where an entire Baltimore City Health Department vaccine team comes out to a group home or facility um, and vaccinates everyone there. This will be, um, which, which strategy is used will be based on what works best for each facility. So we'll be calling um, or contacting facilities and making these plans as we get vaccines. So that's kind of an overview of BCHD's COVID plan. And then next is um, the next slide, the vaccine ambassador program. Oh, one more. Perfect. So last, I'd like to talk about Baltimore City Health Department's COVID-19 vaccine ambassador program. These are community members that will be hired to be trained as peer educators. They'll be paid to do outreach um, and provide education on COVID-19 vaccine within their community. They're trusted messengers and they'll help create communication materials in partnership with the Maryland Institute of College um, of Art, MICA. Um, Baltimore City Health Department has partnered with Morgan State and also the International Vaccine Access Center to recruit, train, and manage this program. Um, the ambassador program is currently in development, but soon we'll start recruiting and hiring ambassadors within every specialty population, including in the DDA community. So this should include people with um, disabilities. Um, it may include family members. It um, should also include staff who work with people with disabilities. So if this interests you or you know someone who may be interested, um, stay tuned. I'll be sending more information um, about this program to Nick Burton, um, who will pass it along. And um, next slide. All right. Thank you. Um, and questions. Um, I'm honored to be here today. I'm happy to take any questions, if, um, however we want to do that. Um, sure. And we do have some questions, and, and thank you so much. Uh, we are really running out of time. I do have a couple, one more slide. Um, can you go to the next slide, Donna? Um, 
just because we always have a lot to share with everyone and, and we do value everything that you're sending us. We value your input, your feedback, your contribution and how we develop our resources. And so uh, the DDS website um, is something that we're making sure that all the information goes on from these webinars, our recorded communication, our emails, um, everything that we have, we wanna make sure you're aware. We also wanted to let you know and to give you an idea of what we're doing with your questions and your comments. So if anything, any question that we have that comes to us that is specific to um, a systemic question or, or something that comes down to frequently asked questions, we then may put it into a specific topic area. If it's a commonly asked questions that are reviewed um, uh, to guide future trainings and webinars, then we will do that. And then we also want to make sure that if there's any specific questions that you may have or issues or concerns that are dealing with your loved one or your family member, um, then we share that with the region. So I just want to know that while we go through this rather quickly, you know, when Dr. Federer joins us, if we have time, we'll read them out loud and, and engage with you guys. If not, we share them and then we'll try to populate and then place them on the website. Um, so I'm not sure if we still have Dr. Federer. I did have a couple of questions for Dr. Federer and I had a couple for Jesse that I know is uh, a little bit after two and I want to be respectful of people's time. I do want to do a clarification um, that Je Jesse said and I want to make sure you don't leave with this. Um, the governor's office and what the governor and what the deputy secretary and the secretary of the department is, we do have people with individual and development disabilities that are in phase 1B. Uh, the certified DSPs are in 1A and other DSPs are in phase 1C. So I just want to make sure we make that very clear uh, so that you know that we do have that and some of the counties and regions are supporting that and making sure they're vaccinating uh, those folks. Um, so um, Donna, is Dr. Federer still with us? Yeah, hi, I'm still here. Oh, great, good. So <laughs> there's a couple of questions for you on the pilot. And then they had some other questions about um, a little bit about more about the, what you said about the vaccination um, in reference to that people would have a harder time fighting the B1351 variant. And then the other one was um, uh, about how is the pilot um, following HIPAA requirements or would that be a violation? Sure. Let me start with the vaccines in B.1.351. So I want to be abundantly clear about this. The vaccines are effective against B.1.351. They, they, you know, all of the vaccines that are currently licensed in the United States and more, I hope, will be licensed soon. It's not, it's not licensed. All those that are emergency authorized in the United States, all that are available in the United States, and the ones that I hope will become available soon, appear to be effective against B.1.351. You're much safer if you have the vaccine than if you don't have the vaccine. You're much less likely to go to the hospital you're much less likely to die. From a big picture public health perspective, we're concerned about B.1.351 because we think maybe on average, these tools won't work quite as well. Or, um, you know, people who have, who have recovered from COVID-19 might get sick a little bit faster than they otherwise would because of B.1.351. So we as the health department are concerned about it. But for the most part, you know, vaccines are effective at preventing, you know, illness, hospitalization, and death, including from B.1.351 uh, and other variants of concern. They're still important. It's much safer to be vaccinated than to not be vaccinated. You know, I intend to be vaccinated as soon as I possibly can. Um, and that's more true now than ever. Uh, you know, the, the variants make vaccines even more important. So uh, address that. So about the pilot, the question is about HIPAA. Sure. So um, the answer is uh, HIPAA absolutely still exists, um, and uh, you know it's not okay to disclose private health information about your staff or your clients. Um, uh, as the Department of Public Health, um, all COVID nineteen test results are reported directly to us by the labs. So that's that's separate from HIPAA because COVID-19 is what's called a reportable disease. So we already know everybody who tests positive for COVID. So it's not a COVID, it's not, a, so I just wanna be clear, it's never a COVID violation 
to tell the Department of Health that someone has tested positive for COVID-19 because the Department of Health already knows that they've tested positive for COVID-19. We just don't, may not know that many details about their life. So when you provide us the rest of your staff, you're not telling us you know, health information about them. You're telling us um, that they work for you. Okay, We're the ones who know the health information, You know, who know whether they've tested positive for COVID-19 or that kind of thing. You're just telling us that they work for you so that we know to keep an eye out for them. Um, and then the third piece, right, is when we find out they test positive, how is it that we're able to tell you, right, because they have a right to medical privacy. So we did consult with uh, our assistant attorney general on this point, and what they said basically is specifically for an urgent public health need, we, the Department of Public Health, are allowed to notify, you know, a concerned party, such as a provider of people, who serve, you know, for people with disabilities, uh, of information that's necessary to keep the public safe. In other words, we can privately and confidentially notice you, notify you that a staff person should be excluded from work. And, um, you know, we just want to verify that they are excluded from work with the expectation that that information is confidential and that you would, of course, not disclose that to anybody else. So, you know, uh, the HIPAA concern is understandable and serious. And as the pilot, grows and moves, um, uh, you know, if further concerns come up, we'll continue to work with our legal team to make sure that they're addressed and so that everything that we do is 100% HIPAA compliant, which currently it is. Um, you Thank are you permitted to participate in this pilot. So if you provide yeah. your roster for not disclosing um, health information about your staff, we're the ones who have the health information. Um, and we it just tells us to keep a closer eye on your staff so that if they do test positive, we can we can put things into motion as needed. Thank you. I know we're eight minutes after, and I really do appreciate those 415 people that are still with us. Um, uh, so, Jesse, you have one question. I'm going to read this one, and then after that, we'll end it. Uh, Dr. Federer, people are eager to to make sure that everything that you say goes into some kind of paperwork or PowerPoint, so they can they can uh, go back and review it. I did let everybody know this is being recorded, so people can access it. Uh, but um, they really appreciate you joining us, and, and Jesse. Uh, Jesse, the last question is: Should you get it vac uh, vaccinated if you have severe allergic reactions? Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. Um, so the only um, you should the 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 short answer is you should discuss all of this with your healthcare provider or vaccine provider. If you go to a mass vaccination site, they will go over, there, there will be healthcare providers there who can go over all that. But um, longer answer is um, the only contraindicating um, allergy, meaning the only reason you can't get the vaccine if you're allergic to something is if you've had a prior um, anaphylactic allergy to the COVID vaccine. So no other allergies um prevent you from getting the COVID vaccine. All right. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you everyone for joining us and continue to join us and have a wonderful Super Bowl weekend. Enjoy your weekend. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.